I'm going to um, talk about the group, uh, my, uh, the work my group is doing. Um, so I was at the University of Delaware for five years, just moved here in January. And uh, this is actually new data that we just got a few days ago, so I'm happy to say we're up and running again. Um, I'm going to talk about engineering photonic quantum states uh, for quantum applications. Okay. Uh, so, you know, photons are everywhere. They're bouncing off uh, all the places in this room. There are almost a trillion photons bouncing around in this room. Uh, photons are quantum particles. Um, and so the idea is we want to use the quantum properties of single photons for new applications. Um, so possible applications are in computing. We can do faster factoring. Uh, we can do search, faster searching of large databases. We can also use photons to simulate quantum systems that would be difficult to understand um, using classical techniques. And then um, we can also use them for communication. So photons, they move at the speed of light. Um, they're robust against fluctuations of their environment. And um, using a quantum, uh, so uh, single photons, we can then send perfectly secure messages. The question is though, how do you generate just the right photons for these sorts of applications? So it's really um, easy to, to pri provide a motivation for um, using photons for, for uh, new types of communication. So I'm just going to talk about one particular motivation. Um, so based on the news nowadays, uh, for example, this headline from USA Today, the NSA uses supercomputers to crack web encryption files show. So clearly, clearly there's something wrong with the current way that we send secret messages. Uh, for example, if we were to use current encryption technology and we wanted to send a message from Everett over to Loomis, um, the way we do it today um, is, well, we could use some uh, algorithm for encoding our message. So a typical one is the RSA algorithm where you use a computer to generate random prime numbers. And then the algorithm gives you some uh, formulas that you can use to then regenerate a, a, a private key that you keep with you and a public key that you send over to the person that wants to send you the secret message. So they write the message, um, they use the public key to encrypt it, and they send it over a transmission line like a fiber optic cable. And then over here, uh, we use our private key to decrypt the message. The only problem with this scheme is if there is an eavesdropper, um, and they, they can take a little bit of the, our, our signal, and since it's a classical signal made up of many photons, we might not notice that they've taken some of our signal. And then once they have it, um, they can then try to crack the encryption by trying to factor the public key. So the only thing keeping them from getting this message is the difficulty of factoring that public key. Okay. Um, right. So. Uh, this is where uh, one application of single photons comes in. So we are going to try to use single photons to have a new, more secure way of communicating. Um, and it's going to use uh, this idea of quantum entanglement. So as you all know, a quantum object can be in a superposition of, of states. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make this cat into a quantum object, you know, kind of inspired by Schrodinger's cat. Okay, so now the cat's a quantum object. Um, that means that um, it can be in two states at once. I'm going to call the first state awake and the second state asleep because I, I like this tiger. Um, I'm going to then write the superposition state like this. So the tiger is both awake and asleep. And if we measure the state, so if we uh, look at what state the tiger is in, it collapses the, the state of the tiger to just one of those. Okay, so that's the idea of measurement in quantum mechanics. Um, now if we have two objects, we can actually entangle them such that knowing about one tells us something about the other. Okay, so uh, this is what an entangled state would look like. This means that if I make a measurement on the tiger and I find it awake, that causes the kitten to also be awake. And if I measure it to be asleep, the kitten is also asleep. Um, yeah, so if I check one object, it's just in one state, causing the other object to also be in just one state. And because they're in this special entangled state, if any measurement is performed, it collapses the states. And this allows us to then detect if someone has eavesdropped on our communication link. Okay. Of course, we're not going to uh, really send tigers and kittens um, over our, commu our communication link. We're going to send photons. And in this case, the information is encoded in the polarization of the photons. So this is a, a polarization entangled photon pair, where if you measure po uh, photon 1 to be uh, uh, vertically polarized, that causes photon 2 to be also vertically polarized, and the same for horizontal. 
<clears throat> okay, so now how do you use this to help you? Well, you could have a source of entangled photon pairs um, that generate photons in this state. You send one photon to point A, the other photon to point B, and then you do some measurements on the polarization of those photons, okay? And um, at the end of the day, you do some comparison of the measurement bases that you use, so what settings of your polarizers and wave plates you use, without sharing the actual results of your measurement. And so you now have a shared secret key that was just generated uh, randomly by your measurements. Now, if someone is eavesdropping, that will change the measurements and you'll be able to detect it because by measuring it, they collapse the states. So that's the idea between, uh, behind this so-called quantum key distribution. Um, the great thing about this is now security is guaranteed by the laws of quantum physics, as long as, mm -hmm. Just to make sure I understand. Yeah. Uh, can they still get the message, but it's detected? Or, or can they not? Well, so in this case, we're actually sending the key. So we're actually generating the key that we use to encode the message. Okay. Yeah, and, and if we find that they've got a bit of it, then we just discard that. We don't use it and we start again. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a different protocol than the classical case. Yeah. All right, so um, that's quantum key distribution. Uh, of course, that's just one of many examples of applications of uh, quantum states of photons. So this is the general field of quantum information that brings together information technology and quantum mechanics. It's based on the use of quantum states. Um, so you can do things like computing, communication, and simulation. Of course, it's not just photons that can do this. You could use um, ions, atoms, quantum dots, and as we saw in the previous talk, uh, condensed matter systems. So in my talk, I'm gonna focus on the optical um, and um, the most common way of generating uh, photons in, in this case is actually in pairs. So this is a called photon pair generation. So you, you have a photon pair source and you get two photons out. And there are two ways of doing that. The um, spontaneous parametric down conversion, uh, which was pioneered by Paul Quiat, um, uh, who is a professor here in the physics department. And uh, what we're using is uh, spontaneous Fourier mixing. Okay, so what is spontaneous Fourier mixing? Um, well, so for every material, it has um, some ability to interact with an electromagnetic field. And uh, in our case, we're using optical fiber. That, um, that optical fiber made of silica has a third order nonlinearity, so it can interact with three uh, electromagnetic fields and produce a, a fourth electromagnetic field. So this is called a chi-3 medium. And spontaneous Fourier mixing corresponds to sending two uh, photons in. We call them the pump photons because we're pumping the, the system with those photons. And then uh, they're annihilated in the medium and uh, spontaneously we generate a signal, a signal photon and an idler photon. So this all obeys energy conservation and momentum conservation. So in this case, it means that two pump photons, uh, if you add up their frequencies, they have to, uh, are equal to the signal and Euler photon frequencies. And um, momentum conservation corresponds to phase matching in this case. Um, so uh, for the particular fiber we're using, it's actually birefringent, so it has a fast and slow axis of propagation. If you send light polarized along one axis, it's gonna go more slowly than along the orthogonal axis. And because of that, we have a very special phase matching condition that ultimately results in a big separation in, 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 in the wavelengths of the photons you produce compared to the photons you put in. And the benefit of this is because they're so far separated, when you want to measure these photons, you don't have any residual photons from your pump that um, are at the wavelengths you're measuring. Um, so what we do is we send our pump photons in the form of a laser pulse uh, along the slow axis of the optical fiber. They generate photons on the orthogonal axis just because of the phase matching condition of the fiber. And uh, then we have signal and idler photons. Okay, so that's how we generate photon pairs. Uh, the next, whoa, start too fast. The next one is to uh, generate an entangled state. 
Okay, so in the previous slide, I generated a pair of photons, but they were both in the same polarization states. For example, they were both vertical. Uh, what we want is a state HH plus VV. We want it to look like that. So in order to produce that, I'm going to take the fiber and I'm going to put it in a, what's called a Sognac loop configuration. And the way this works is um, when we send in our pump photons, there's a polarizing beam splitter that reflects vertically polarized photons and transmits horizontally polarized photons. The vertically polarized photons are launched into the slow axis of the optical fiber, and then they will generate photon pairs on the orthogonal axis, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, so there goes the vertically polarized pump. We have horizontally polarized photon pairs generated by that pump, um, but we've twisted the fiber by 90 degrees so that by the time they exit the fiber, they're actually both vertical. That gives us our state VV. So we've generated a, a pair of photons, both with vertical polarization, and if you measure one uh, vertical, the other one is vertical. Now to get the other half of the equation, HH, we send in a horizontally polarized pump, and in that case we have vertically polarized photons that rotate because we twisted the fiber, so they're horizontal by the time they exit, and this gives us our HH state. So there you go. Now how can we say that's entangled? Well, that's the case if we send in both of those pump, pump polarizations at the same time. So here I have a 45 degree polarized uh, pump pulse, which is a, a, a linear combination of vertical and horizontal. And since on order less than one photon pair is produced per pulse, um, when we do detect one out here, we don't know which pathway it took. It might have been generated along this direction or along this direction. <clears throat> and that provides us that lack of information that ultimately results in entanglement. <clears throat> so um, now we have an entangled, a uh, polarization entangled photon pair. Now we can't, um, so this is what the experiment looks like. Um, the, uh, the issue then is how do you check your entanglement? How do you make sure that it's a high degree of entanglement? It's really the state that you wanted. Um, to do that, in addition to the Sognac loop, we have to have some analysis, and that's what the bulk of this experiment is showing. <clears throat> so this is our source of pulses. This is a mode lock tie sapphire laser. As you saw in the first talk, it's generating uh, uh, pulses about 150 femtoseconds in duration uh, uh, with, at a frequency of 80 megahertz. And then we have a half wave plate that rotates it to 45 degrees. It's sent into our Sognac loop, so again, uh, horizontally polarized photons will go in and generate uh, a, a pair of photons here that exit, and a vertically polarized uh, pump will generate photon pairs in this direction that also connects it here. And both occur simultaneously. We don't know which one generates the pair, and so they're entangled right at the output. <coughs> Um, we can then separate the, the two photons. So they're at different frequencies. So we can just use a dichroic mirror to separate them. Um, so the, the signal photons will go this direction, the either photons will go this direction. And then we can measure their polarization states. So this is with a quarter half wave plate and polarizer. Um, and then we clean up the spectrum a bit and we then uh, count coincidences using avalanche photodiodes. So, um, uh, yeah, so the idea is that you do a, a complete set of polarization measurements. So uh, you, you, you measure the joint polarization state of your photon pair to fully characterize what that state is and to see if it's entangled. <clears throat> and the way uh, we plot our data uh, is to reconstruct uh, what's called the density matrix. If you're not familiar with the density matrix, the main things to know about this are, um, so you can see these are your pair states. So photon one and H, photon two and H. And the most important uh, part about this density matrix are, are these off-diagonal terms that correspond to VV crossing with HH here. That represents the presence of strong entanglement. Um, so you want these to be about the same height as the diagonal terms, and you want the rest of them to be zero. And you can see this is our reconstructed matrix from our, from our uh, measurement, and we have uh, fairly good entanglement uh, from our system. Um, and so we have a fidelity to the, the entangled state that we were aiming for of about 95%. <coughs> um, you can also quantify exactly how good this entanglement is using a quantity called the tangle. The maximum possible tangle is one. Our tangle is 0.82, typically about 0.7. And above 0.7 is, is something that can be useful for quantum applications. <coughs> <coughs> 
So, so it, it's fairly useful, you know, we, we, could, we could use this source, but the question arises, you know, why isn't it perfect? Why is it not higher? Um, what causes degradation in the source? Could it, um, and then you start thinking about all the other degrees of freedom in your setup. So right now, this is showing only the polarization degree of freedom, but in addition, you can think about spatial degree of freedom, you can think about the spectrum of the photons. Perhaps different frequencies of the photons actually result in different density matrices, but we don't see that because we're not resolving that. Um, and so the next step is, you know, we want to figure out what's limiting this source. So this is uh, uh, characterizing the source of our photon pairs. Okay, so uh, to probe the spectral variations, one thing you could do is you could just add filters that look at very narrow spectral bands uh, of your photons and take a quantum state tomography for each frequency range. Okay, so that would just correspond to adding filters, spectral filters in the arms here and, um, and just uh, collecting photons at only certain frequencies. But that's actually going to take a really long time. So already just for one uh, quantum state tomography, it takes about 15 minutes. If you want to have a really high resolution scan over all the frequencies, um, say you want you know, 0.1 nanometers over 10 nanometers, that's going to be a very, very long experiment. And over that amount of time, you're going to end up um, having changes in your setup and so on. So uh, to overcome this, uh, we worked with collaborators, uh, Marco Lissadini and John Seip, um, to implement their, their new way of measuring such correlations in a, in a method called stimulated emission tomography. So the idea here is, um, you know, we have our quantum process that corresponds to two pump photons uh, creating signal and idler. Um, but it also has a classical analog that corresponds to if you send a classical light field at the same frequency of the idler, you can have what's called stimulated Fourier mixing, where you have much, many, many more uh, signal photons. So the number of signal photons that are generated are proportional to the number of photons that you're inputting as the seed. So this is the average number of photon pairs that would be spontaneously generated. This is the number of signal photons. This is the number of either photons. And you can see um, that the resulting average number of stimulated signal photons is increased by a factor, and this factor is the number of photons you're inputting as your seed. So what this allows us to do is it just amplifies our signal. We don't have to collect over a really long time anymore. We can just take a quick, um, you know, even with a, a a regular photodiode, not an avalanche uh, photodiode. We can then collect our data. Um, and we can also, you know, we can vary the frequency of this seed to look at particular frequencies, uh, <coughs> combinations between idler and signal. Okay. <clears throat> so the way we do that is we take our original setup. This is the quantum state tomography that we did. And now we add a few more things. So we're now going to add uh, another laser. This is going to serve as the seed that amplifies our signal. Um, it's going to go in uh, the, the pathway that the idler photons would take. It's just going uh, again, um, in the opposite direction. And then this is going to stimulate photons in the signal. And uh, we can then measure those on a spectrometer and frequency resolve it. <coughs> So this is our new density matrix. And um, the way we've plotted it is uh, this is the, the, the data up here, and then this is a projection. So um, this is the full density matrix, and then this is just the color map underneath. Um, but the terms are the same. The ones that are important for entanglement are the off-diagonal terms here and here. And if we um, just compare this to our previous data, so for the quantum state tomography, we just had um, a very simple matrix because we weren't resolving in frequency, but now we are resolving in frequency, and if we just zoom in on one of these off-diagonal terms, it has a lot of structure to it. So clearly there are some uh, frequencies that have different density matrices than uh, the others, and the optimal value for this should be around the yellow-orange values, and there are only a few of them that are really optimally entangled. The other frequencies are not. And if you don't filter out those frequencies, that's going to degrade your entanglement. Okay. Um, to see that even more clearly, um, this is the, the tangle. So before we just had one value, um, and now we have a whole series of values at different combinations of wavelengths. So this is the signal wavelength, and this is the idler wavelength along this axis. 
And you can see for each wavelength combination, you, you have a different degree of entanglement. Your best entanglement is a, a little bit above 0.9 here, but then outside of that, you have much lower entanglement. Um, so this is really the first time we can see um, all the possible reasons why an entangled photon pair source might not produce what you expect. So, and it also shows for the first time why filtering the spectrum, as commonly done in such experiments, can improve your entanglement. Uh, this data was, was just taken a few days ago, so um, we're still going to we're still going to analyze it, understand all of the structure, and, and use it to improve our source. Um, well, uh, I, I'm ending a, a bit early. I hope that's okay. Um, so to conclude, we, we demonstrated entanglement of photon pairs from optical fiber. We showed that we can use frequency resolved reconstruction of the density matrix uh, with stimulated emission. And this provides new insight into frequency polarization correlations. So for different frequencies, you have different density matrices, which means you have different entangled photon pairs. Um, and this technique is useful for characterizing such sources and optimizing and engineering them. Um, so this work was done, uh, I have a great, great graduate students that came with me from Delaware, in particular Bin Fong, uh, did all of the measurements uh, that I talked about today. Um, and thank you very much for your time.